Good morning, broadcasters. 360 seconds news and commentary for broadcast professionals is on the air. I'm Mark from TKT 1957. Let's discuss the latest technological news with our respected expert, Phil Brussman. Don't forget to give the program a like. Google DeepMind released a generative video model VO. Philip, VO is their most capable video generation model that is available up to date. It generates high quality 1080p resolution videos that go beyond a minute in a wide range of cinematic and visual styles. Do you mind sharing with us? What are your thoughts about this, the AI technology as a whole and on the industry and how it could affect jobs? Sure. You know, AI for me, I, I, I jokingly refer to it as algorithmic imitation. It's, it's generating new stuff, but only based on things it's been trained. I, I think it's a great tool and we're seeing more and more capabilities, but like anything else, people will abuse it. Uh, it'll get overused. Um, and then of course the biggest one is copyright who trained it. So the question always becomes, is it in theory, whatever it has generated is based on something somebody else has created. Now, all that aside, I think in general, generative AI in video, it, it has a fantastic role for visualization and storyboarding. I think it's great. It's, it, it enables you to really create something other than this, just a drawing on the screen that somebody has to sort of, okay, I sort of get what you're saying in the conversation or, you know, about what kind of program you want to build. Um, I think this just takes it to that next level where when you're dealing with uh, either financers or a studio or just your team in general, it helps sort of get that thought across. Um, I think the bigger issue is people wanting to just generate content from the ground up for this and distribute it. Um, is it, is it going to be much value? No, it'll be neat. You'll see a lot. I mean, the first music video came out not too long ago. It was interesting, but it was monotonous, to be quite honest. It was the same thing over and over again. Um, it, you know, I think that the best line I've heard from one of my friends is, you're not going to be replaced by AI. You're going to be replaced by a person who uses AI. And I think that's true with any tool. Um, uh, my biggest concern, I think, in the industry around the AI movement is so let's as, as an example you're an assistant editor your main job is to call together potential shots and then when you show them to the editor the editor goes oh no this isn't very good because of x well this is great because of y and so you learn well now if i can train ai to sort of pick the shots for me what happens to that assistant editor that assistant editor doesn't exist anymore that assistant editor cannot become a lead editor so there's a potential for you know, disruption in, you know, this is an artistic industry, uh, a disruption in that artistic length or that, or, you know, the, the artistic input and the next generation of editors, things may become very robotic. I, you know, I think AI is great uh, if used right, but like anything else, you know, what they say with, with great power comes great responsibility. And another question I have just as a follow-up is how would young individuals that are coming into the professional field right now, what would you uh, recommend them to focus and what would you recommend those you know with up to five years of work, work experience to do how should they integrate their ai application right so i think it, it, it it's it's important that they learn how to use the tools like anything else if you're going to become an editor learn how to use the editing tools now that i think the big issue is always around um you know oh i only know how to use premiere or I only know how to use Resolve, or I only know how to use Final Cut. They're all tools. Now you can become an expert in tools, but as a young professional, you want to really expose yourself to a lot of the different tools and make sure you understand how they all work. And I think it's the same for AI. You start to understand the value of the human in the AI chain and sort of exploit that as a young professional, figuring out how can I use this to speed up the process, help me do my job better, just like any other tool, uh, but you don't want to get lazy and go, well, I could edit this, but I'm just going to use the text and use AI and let it do all the editing for me. I think that's like anything else. You have to be careful that you don't become lazy because of the tools. Now, going into the next piece of news I wanted to talk to, but to you about, we have the outdoor videography high brightness monitor by Convision, the A7S. Now, Chinese company manufacturer Convision, they've been very well known for their broadcasting equipment since 2009. And now introducing the A7S, they have this new seven inch touchscreen monitor that supports 4K 60P recording. 
and boasts a high brightness level of 1500 nits. This is an interesting solution. Philip, what are your impressions of this one? So, you know, I, I, I've, there's a lot of seven inch monitors coming out. I think it's great. Um, the more tools I have to choose from, the better. I think the big issue is how do you differentiate? Uh, in their world, it seems that they're, they're sort of differentiating that they're also a recorder, which is great. Uh, they do ProRes, which is pretty much a standard. It's, it's, you know, I don't know if it'll be the primary record module on set, but it's, it's perfect for backup. And for those who maybe don't have a camera that can record in ProRes, but is recording, say, H.264, 265, it's a little more compressed. This gives them uh, an additional tool to use. I think the high brightness is fantastic. Um, I tend to think that people, well, let me take that. People tend to push uh, color accuracy of these little monitors a little further than they need to. Now, if you are shooting on set uh, and you're shooting in ProRes, okay, the color accuracy helps a little bit because you have a better understanding. If you're shooting raw on a red or an RE or a black magic, the need for color accuracy sort of goes away because you are shooting on a raw camera and capturing in raw. So you have a lot more latitude, but it's always nice to be close. And I think that, that touting that extra color accuracy is a good thing. Um, the, the brightness is great. The only thing I don't know about is I don't know what the cost is. I would assume it's going to be relatively low as, as we have more and more of these panels coming out, which I think is great for, especially for new filmmakers uh, to be able to get a hold of a tool like this, that'll help them. So. Fantastic. I appreciate your responses. We're now going to transition to the next topic of discussion that will be introduced by my co-host Pax. With the breaking news, according to Canon, the EOS R1 will dramatically improve the performance of both stills and video in comparison to the EOS R3. And um, it will meet high requirements of professionals on the front lines of various fields, introducing sports, news, reporting, and video production. Who is the target audience for the EOS R1? Who would you know benefit the most from it? And also, how do you feel um, just in comparison to the price point of the EOS R3, will it be worth it or, or not? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of details, although we know that the R1 is typically Canon's flagship camera. They're launching it or announcing it and launching it in conjunction with the uh, Summer Olympic Games. So um, knowing how Canon works, I would suspect it's going to have some groundbreaking technology in it. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear the word AI show up every once in a while. What, what's really going to be most interesting for me is, are they moving to a global shutter? We've seen this, I believe, Sony recently. And of course, the, the red cinema cameras have all moved to global shutters um, as opposed to rolling shutters. And that, that's really a necessity nowadays for fast moving sports action when you're doing video. And what we're finding is a lot of stills photographers are... Um, I don't know, being forced is maybe the wrong word, but are, are being asked to capture more video. And the reality is if I'm capturing 8K at 30 frames a second, that's 35 megapixels per frame. So I can actually pull a still from that. So the target audience is definitely going to be professionals for this camera. It's probably going to be priced at about that level as well, $799, $7,999. I would suspect that's typically where that camera gets priced at. Um it will have longer record times. Uh, I'm hoping that they have sort of learned their lesson from the initial R5, which really had some overheating issues because of the way it was designed. Um, you know, not necessarily a fault of, of Canon, but it was a new camera, new technology. So this one's going to be very, very focused on sports, high frame rates. I would suspect it's going to be in that 45 to 60 megapixel range uh, for the stills image. Uh, it will record 8K. I can almost guarantee it since the R5 records 8K. Uh, it will do it in RAW. Uh, uh, the big question is, will they have a... Um, a global shutter in it, where if, if they do, then I think it's, it becomes a real game changer in terms of the professional stills slash hybrid uh, video market. So there, it could be very interesting uh, what they bring out. I'm excited. I'm a Canon shooter. I've been shooting Canon for 20 some odd years. Uh, always excited when they bring out their flagship camera, because it also signals the tech that will eventually make it down into the R3 Mark II, the R5 Mark II, and, and down the pipe. All right. 
Wow. And then also, would you see yourself actually, you know, acquiring this camera? And then if you did, what would be the first project that you would see yourself using it on if you had any in mind? Yeah, so it's a potential. It, if it has a global shutter in it for video, I no doubt about it when I purchase the camera. Um, I, you know, if if it does not, the additional megapixels for me isn't that much. I'm not necessarily a sports shooter, so the high shutter speeds that are typically going to be, or the, the high frame rates, as you say, that you're you're typically going to see in a camera like this, and the autofocus are all wonderful uh, tech. It just doesn't necessarily do much more than what I need it to do. But I can tell you, if it does have a global shutter, then it's going to become my all around camera. I'm um, you know I'm going to go shoot an air show this weekend. If I had this camera and it had a global shutter, I would be taking one camera to the show and capturing both stills in motion. Uh, I tend to try and do that today with my R5. But the, the, unfortunately, that rolling shutter on fast moving objects does show itself as a, as a weakness. But again, if they put a global shutter in that camera, um, Canon always has a unique issue with they have a cinema line as well. And if they put too much of the cinema tech into a stills camera, do they cannibalize that industry? And, it, and unfortunately, the way Japanese companies tend to be set up is they compete with one another. So, you know, the cinema group is not going to necessarily give the tech to the seals group and vice versa. Uh, I wish it wasn't that way, but that's just sort of the industry we live in. A whole lot of thanks to the experts for watching. Uh, thank you to Phil Grosman for taking the time to speak with us and um, of course, give us his opinion and expertise on the new upcoming tech. Uh, we'll see you next Monday at the same time. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. Bye-bye.